This morning we're interviewing Robert Smullen, Marine Corps veteran of three campaigns in Afghanistan. Robert served from 1991 to 2015, retiring with the rank of Colonel. This interview is being recorded on Monday, December 19, 2022, at the New York Military Museum. Interviewer is Paul Hawshin. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Paul. It's great to be here with you. Well, we appreciate you coming in. As we discussed, it's intended to be part of the oral history archives at the military museum. Started. So, Bob, could you tell us where you grew up and how you came to join the Marine Corps? Oh, that's great. Uh, so, I am from the town of Johnstown, uh, just outside of Gloversville, from a little unincorporated hamlet called Miko, uh, which was made famous, at least in my youth, by having an elementary school and a fire company uh, right there. My, uh, my family has always lived there uh, for, you know, dec really decades, generations. We were in the mason reconstruction business where we would build things out of block, brick, stone, concrete, uh, for anybody that wanted something built from whether it was from a fireplace in your house to a factory we could do it all so how did you get an interest in the United States Marine Corps and how did you come to join the Marine Corps well I think in retrospect I was deeply uh, impressed by the amount of veterans in the community as you know specifically at the Miko volunteer fire company there were veterans that had served from World War II uh, through Vietnam that were always present they were great community supporters, they were firemen, they supported the fire company, uh, and including in my own family, my great uncle, my grandfather's younger brother, was a veteran of the 28th Infantry Division at the Pennsylvania National Guard uh, during the Battle of the Bulge. Another close relative was a member of the 10th Mountain Division, uh, part of the ski troops that served in Italy during World War II, and they really sparked uh, quite a bit of interest in the military. Uh, and, and including my father, who was also a veteran. He was not a combat veteran. Uh, he didn't think that he was uh, of the same kind as the ones that served in World War II and in Korea and Vietnam. He actually served in the Army uh, between Korea and Vietnam. Uh, and of course, uh, they all affected me deeply in my, my desire to be in the military, which uh, seemed to be a, a, you know, a good thing to do from you know, coming from Gloversville in the 1980s. So why the Marine Corps? Well, uh, the Marine Corps actually had the shortest officer commitment uh, that was allowed. I'd always I'd gotten a pilot's license when I was in, in 1988, when I was a young man, I was about 19 years old, and I thought, wow, it'd be great to be a military pilot. Uh, the problem was, and I took the test, and they said, yeah, you'd, you'd be a great pilot, but uh, you had to sign up for seven years after two years of flight school. So that was like a 10-year commitment. And I was 22, 23 years old. No way was I going to sign out for 10 years uh, just to fly airplanes, that uh, sort of thing. Although it would have been, I'm sure it would have been a great, uh, great experience. Uh, so instead, I signed up for a three and a half year ground officer's commitment, which uh, took me from where I went to college, which was the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I went in there after graduation. I went to officer candidate school, and I was commissioned in uh, after officer candidate school in April of 1991. You went to the Citadel. That's a very famous military academy. Can you tell us a little bit about it? It is. It's actually it's a beautiful school. It's in Charleston, South Carolina, which if you can imagine someone coming from the frozen wilds of the Adirondacks, uh, you know, living in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains, uh, to coastal Carolina in uh, the fall of 1986, uh, you, know, you want to talk about being a fish out of water. Uh, that was tr a true experience. But uh, what I do say is that they had a great uh, teaching program there, specifically for military history, was what I was interested in at the time. Uh, and I was very determined, uh, and I, I took uh, history classes there. And when I graduated and, and went into the Marine Corps, it was a great fit. Uh, specifically because my family, we were uh, very hard workers. Uh, for about 90 years, we had a, a, a Mason Reconstruction business. And from the, from the time I was 12 years old till when I I uh, went into officer candidate school. I worked for about 10 years on and off at, at, uh, during the summers uh, for our, you know, doing really hard work, making you know, stuff out of block, brick, stone, concrete. And, and I thought actually officer candidate school was a breeze compared to being a, uh, a laborer on a construction site. It was well suited for being, for me, uh, from being from the Adirondacks where you'd go hunting, you'd go fishing, 
uh, I was very outdoors oriented. Uh, perhaps I should have studied a little bit more, but uh, I really, uh, it was a good fit you know, for someone you know, to sign up for an initial hitch is what I thought in the Marine Corps for three and a half years. Now are you commissioned then, uh, knowing that the Citadel is equivalent to West Point or Annapolis, is that correct? Well, it, it has ROTC and all students take ROTC, so I took Naval ROTC there my uh, junior and senior years. So what that meant was is that I had taken a lot of classes about what was, what was it like to be in the Marine Corps. Uh, and I, I'd considered joining the Air Force, I looked at the Army, uh, but ultimately it was the Marine Corps that I commissioned into. So you successfully completed officer candidate school, and in the Marine Corps you have to go to the basic school. Could you tell, that seems to me unique to the Marine Corps, could you tell us about that? Well, it really is. Uh, Officer Candidate School for the Marine Corps is unique in that it does a screening and evaluation process for young officers to find out if their aptitude, if their abilities, if their ambitions are compatible with the Marine Corps, essentially. And really, it's to, to weed out those who won't be successful as officers. Once you graduate from Officer Candidate School, I actually reported directly to the basic school. So from basically February of 1991 through December, of, of 1991 when I graduated from infantry officer course after the basic school. Uh, I was in training at Quantico for the entire year. Notably, that was when Desert Storm actually kicked off, the actual invasion uh, of Kuwait and the, the operations uh, against the Iraqi army. So when people ask me, were, was I in the Marine Corps during Desert Storm? The answer is yes, I was, but no, I did not serve. I was in my initial officer training at Quantico. But at that time, we did not know how long that war would last. So as you're going through this, are you expecting to go to war? You never know. Uh, they thought that it was going to be a lot tougher uh, fight than it really was. And instead of a hundred year war, a hundred hour war, it was going to be, you know, something of some indeterminate amount. And, you know, there's all sorts of speculation when you're sitting at Quantico and training, you know, would, would you be into a combat replacement company and, you know, replace someone who had been killed or wounded? But no, it never happened. Uh, we went straight through to Quantico. Uh, I did take the basic school, which is kind of different uh, than other services. All Marine Corps officers go through the basic school. And what it does is it provides a, a basic instruction on how to be a platoon leader, uh, how, to, how to lead people, how to manage uh, the idea that all Marine are riflemen, that you could lead them in combat operations if it's required, whether you're a pilot, whether you're a logistician, whether you're a, you know, a specialty uh, officer of some sort, all Marine Corps officers go through the basic school. And for, for me, personally, it was the precursor to going to the infantry officer course, which is what I ultimately uh, became my first Marine Corps MOS, which was 0302 infantry officer. So at this point, you are the pointy end of the spear. And tell us about your first assignment. Where was it? What was it like to be a platoon commander? It was, a, it was a fantastic experience for a first tour of duty. I was assigned to 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, which is at Marine Corps Air Station, Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. So my first, du my first duty station, uh, believe it or not, was, was to be sent to Oahu to join, in this case, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, in the very beginning of 1992. Tough duty out in Hawaii, huh? That's what they say, but you know, uh, I wasn't really there in Hawaii a lot. My first basically three year tour of duty, I was a, a rifle platoon commander, then a weapons platoon commander, and a company executive officer. We actually did two deployments, unit deployment program rotations to Okinawa, Japan, uh, where, we, would, where we, we were based and trained as part of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force, Force, 3rd Marine Division out of Okinawa. And our main job there was to provide forward presence in the Western Pacific. So. From the time that I got to Hawaii to when I left nearly three years later, I was actually only in Hawaii about half the time. So that was your first assignment as a platoon commander. Could you tell us about your follow up? We're up to what? About 1993 or 4 now? Uh, to the, right, that's right. At the end of 1994, I was in Hawaii from 92 to 94. Wonderful time. Great Marines. I learned so much from bringing Marines from all over the United States, bringing them together. Into a, an, into a platoon and a new rifle company and making the mission happen for what it was sort of thing. It's a, a truly uh, where I learned that the military is the real institution, the number one institution of national
international unity in the United States. Because we had Marines from all over. I was so proud to serve with them, uh, including where I met uh, a Marine that made a great impression on me, Gunnery Sergeant Michael Chan, who is my platoon sergeant and weapons platoon uh, of Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, who I'll talk about a little bit more about later. Well, could you tell us about that? Uh, we're finding now, especially in the war in Ukraine, as we train the Ukrainians, that small unit leadership, with NCOs being relied on for the leadership of the unit, could you talk about your relationship with your senior NCOs? Uh, it was a great relationship. So, you know, being a new lieutenant, someone with not a lot of experience, uh, whether in life or, or, you know, training experience, you rely very closely on your NCOs and your staff non-commissioned officers. And, and in the case of uh, the Marines I served with in Hawaii, uh, they were very experienced. Uh, a lot of them had been in that duty station before. A lot of them had just come back from Desert Storm. Uh, so they had actually been deployed from Hawaii into uh, Kuwait for about seven or eight months. Uh, and then they'd come back and then that's when I joined the unit. So you learn to trust and rely on your NCOs. Uh, guys like Sergeant Mike Kelly, uh, Corporal Gillingham, Corporal Shore, the ones that you first with, you know, were, uh, were stationed with, including a guy named Staff Sergeant Doug Personius. You know them, uh, you, get to, you get to know them, and then you get on your feet, and then your natural leadership uh, instincts take over, and you become an, a good officer. So you had approximately three years right there in the company level. What happened? To, and then your obligation's done, is it not? My obligation was done. In fact, I was very close to getting out of the Marine Corps at that point. Uh, I'd always, uh, when I graduated from the Citadel, I had been accepted to Georgetown University at the School of Foreign Service in one of their graduate programs. Uh, so I had uh, reapplied and I had basically gotten my application renewed and my acceptance renewed. Uh, so I wanted to go back to the Washington, D.C. area. So I took orders to work at the Marine Corps headquarters, which is actually in Washington, D.C. It, was, it used to be at a place called the Navy Annex, which is right near the Pentagon. Uh, and I took a job as the operations officer of the Marine Corps casualty section. We did three things there. We took care of Marines and their families that had been killed or injured on active duty, uh, both from an administrative standpoint, but also making sure that they were well taken care of. We also did uh, full honors military ceremonies in Arlington Cemetery. So I did about 150 uh, full honors military ceremonies in Arlington, actually directing the funerals making sure that the honors were provided, taking care of the families, making sure uh, that as we laid someone, as we laid a Marine to rest in Arlington, uh, that everything was done by the book. Uh, really, really moving job, very, uh, very intense, uh, very uh, character building in so many different ways, about learning how people are, learning about how the Marine Corps takes care of Marines. Uh, it was a fantastic experience in retrospect. So these weren't just active duty Marines, but all Marines. All Marines. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. Uh, in the, at the Pusan perimeter in 1950, uh, the Marines sent a brigade there under the command of a guy named Brigadier General Edward Craig. I actually laid Lieutenant General Craig to rest in Arlington Cemetery. The hero of Pusan, who saved, you know, saved the Pusan perimeter. Talk about a connection across time uh, from, you know, literally from the middle of the 1990s to the Korean War, uh, I took care of uh, you know those sorts of things. So it was really it was a really uh, really good growth experience for me. So you said you were at Henderson Hall headquarters for approximately two years, about years? two and a half years. And what did you do after that? Uh, so then, uh, and this is where the Marine Corps uh, they've got this system where they incentivize people to stay around. They selected me for the Amphibious Warfare School, which is a if you're a you know, junior captain in the Marine Corps, and you get selected for the school, it means, hey, you're doing very well in the Marine Corps, we value your service, would you like to go back to the Fleet Marine Force and be a company commander, uh, essentially? And, uh, you know, as an infantry officer, that's a, you know, that's a big role, it means that you've, you know, you're doing well, uh, and I just, I just got married at the time, and my wife and I, we were very excited. Not only did I get to go to Amphibious Warfare School, but I got good orders to go out to Camp Pendleton, California uh, to be part of the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. So I'd been in 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines. Now I was going to be part of 1st Battalion, 1st Marines in California. So now you're joining the storied 1st Marine Division. And this is where you'll stay for a few years? That's right. So, you know, when you get sent out to a job like that, it's 
two years at least, three years, maybe four years. And I was very fortunate that the battalion that I was assigned to was part of the Marine Expeditionary Unit Special Operations Capable Program, the MUSOC program. So they're the ones that deploy on Navy ships out of San Diego. So we have the Marines at Camp Pendleton, the Navy ships down at San Diego. They come together, they train, and then they go forward to be forward deployed, in this case to the Persian Gulf, to the Arabian Gulf, uh, in 1998, 1999 time period, period is when I did my first deployment. So you're in the Arabian Gulf, boarded, and what kind of duties did you do? The special operators capable? You trained and you were there in case something happened? That's right. So we were part of the Iraq war plan. At the time, if you recall, you know, we defeated Saddam Hussein in Kuwait, but he had retreated into Iraq and he reconstituted his forces. So there was always the threat that the Iraqi army could you know, do something again in, in, the, in the Persian Gulf, in the Arabian Gulf. Uh, it was a very uncertain period of time. It's, uh, you know, working up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, the war plan was very important, and the Marines were always part of that plan. And the MUSOC, it was always, there was always a MUSOC present to be able to provide uh, a whole series of mission sets, including uh, the defense of Kuwait, but also to do maritime interdiction operations. I was part of a group, the Maritime Special Purpose Force. Our job would be to board uh, uh, ships that were violating the sanctions that were imposed against the Iraqis and the Iranians at the time. A lot of oil smuggling, now, there was gas and oil platforms in the Gulf. We were designed to go out like, like on a helicopter, chase a ship down, and then we would fast rope down onto the ship, take it over, and then you know, uh, make it compliant with UN sanctions, for instance. Sounds like even training for that is pretty dangerous. Uh, it can be. It, uh, it, in fact, in that, during that time frame, there was actually a, a very bad helicopter accident off the coast of California where we lost nine Marines in that very training. So yeah, you had to be very careful uh, while you're doing the training. I, I learned a lot about managing operational risk uh, during that time when I was the company commander for headquarters and service company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, and then I became the weapons company commander for 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. So I got a, a lot of experience. I got to know a lot of the Marines in 1-1, 1 -1, 1st first Battalion, 1st first Marines. Out of about 850 Marines in a normal battalion, I knew 400 of them by their names, what their families were like, and everything, because I commanded two companies uh, in that battalion. At the same time? Uh, no, oh. one first headquarters and service, okay. and then I was moved over to weapons company. So this is taking your career up through what year? So this was about through uh, December of 1999, is when we returned from deployment. On our way back from deployment from the Persian Gulf, we actually were assigned to go to East Timor. Uh, they had a terrible uh, you know, change of government there, where they basically burned Dili, which was the capital of East Timor. They, they burned the place down. And the Australians were near neighbors to them. They needed logistical help. So we, the MU, was sent there as part of the amphibi with the Amphibious Ready Group to provide helicopter and logistics support to the, uh, to the Australian Army, which was in East Timor. That was when I actually earned my first humanitarian service ribbon. It was kind of a, a different experience. Uh, we were off, offshore of East Timor for about 30 days on our way back from the Persian Gulf. So you're on humanitarian assistance. How are you aiding the people of East Timor? Uh, providing anything that they needed in terms of the logistics uh, that we had. The, the flow of humanitarian aid had started to come in at that time. Uh, the Australians were providing ground security for it, so we were moving them around with helicopters. Very, very interesting uh, operation for the, for the MU at the time. Now, would that have been your first experience with joint operations with allies? Uh, well, we'd done some operations before. When I was in 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, we did a lot of training with the Japanese uh, in northern Japan as well as at, the, at Mount Fuji. So I'd done quite a, quite a few experiences, but this was the first one where it was a, a real operation. It was Operation Interfet, uh, UN uh, operation in East Timor. So you've been a company commander with the 1st Marine Division, and what's next? So that was really uh, that, that MUSOC deployment in 99 when I came back. Uh, I had been chosen to be the operations officer for the battalion, to stay in the battalion for another two years, uh, to go out and deploy again sort of thing. So when they change, after a, after a deployment, they usually change out the leadership, the, the battalion commander, the battalion executive.
executive officer change out. I was chosen to stay. I would be the operations officer. I just made the previous deployment, had a lot of experience getting on and off ships, about how to land the Marines off the ships, helicopter experiences. I'd also been sent to the Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics uh, School out at Yuma, Arizona. So I was actually a weapons and tactics instructor for the, for the aviation side. I, I knew how to do all the fire support. I knew all the logistics from being the h &S company commander. So I was very fortunate. I got to stay in the battalion for two more years. So the Marines are famed for their air ground coordination. So you're the ground side of that fabled air ground team? That's right. But I was the guy that also coordinated the air side. So I had a really a good uh, set of experiences to stay and deploy again with the, the next USOC uh, starting in 2000 until you know, 2002. So we're talking that when you are deployed on a heli I'm going to say a helicopter carrier? That's right. In this case, it was LHA-5, the USS Palolo. I really got to mention what an experience. We deployed with the Palolo in 1999, and we deployed with the Palolo again in 2001. So I knew that ship and the other ships of the Amphibious Ready Group uh, like the back of my hand. I'd spent, I have nearly a year of sea time in my record, uh, which is kind of neat uh, because sometimes Marines get more or less sea time, but I had it all on the USS Palolo LHA-5. Well, that brings us to the question, which is, where were you when the towers came down in 2001, and what was your reaction? Well, so I was actually in Darwin, Australia, with 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, as part of the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, Special Operations Capable. My, uh, my battalion commander at the time was a guy named Christopher Bourne, and my new commander was a, a colonel by the name of Thomas Waldhauser. We had done an entire workup uh, for six months before we deployed in August of 2001. We thought we were going to go to the Persian Gulf and do our normal peacetime patrol. We are going to do some exercises in the United Arab Emirates. We were going to go to Kenya and do a, you know, a, a presence mission there. We were going to go to Djibouti. We had gone all these things. But none of that happened. All the plans that, that we had laid were instantly changed because we were in Darwin, Australia we just done a training exercise, you know, come halfway across the Pacific on ships. When the towers fell, we upped anchor and we knew that we were going to be part of the response force to go into Afghanistan after September 11th. So, as was happening in Afghanistan, we've all seen the movies where the Northern Alliance and the Special Forces and the Air Force is bombing the Taliban, and they're off there out north of Kabul. They're coming down to Kabul, but the Marines are out there on the water. Is that correct? That's right. We were in the Gulf of Oman. We'd also done a security mission in Jacobabad, Pakistan. We'd set up an air base there for our combat search and rescue folks, and it ultimately transitioned to be a support base for the invasion of Afghanistan itself. The problem with the, the picture in November of 2001 is that we didn't have any allies in southern Afghanistan. Now, they were the ones that had supported the Taliban, and we didn't have any of the uh, Northern Alliance uh, relationships down in southern Afghanistan. So it was our job to go in and seize Ford Operating Base Rhino to open a, a base in southern Afghanistan and then to conduct combat operations in southern Afghanistan. So what, what the American public saw was the Marines coming off of its ships in CH-53 helicopters linking up with C-130s and, and I was actually in, in Pakistan with about 400 Marines. We linked up and then we landed at Fort Operating Base Rhino, seized it, and then we started to do follow-on operations from there. Well, I believe General Mattis was questioned saying the Marine Corps is an amphibious organization, but this is a landlocked country. But the it's, Marines chose to project that. How long was the insertion? It was about 350 miles. Uh, so it was a really long, uh, uh, long operation. It, uh, we came off of not only uh, the USS Palolo, but there was another um, USOC that had joined up from the uh, Atlantic uh, side, and we, we combined all of our forces under Task Force 58, in which General Mattis was the commander, and we basically bounced into Afghanistan from our Navy ships, you know, supported by, in, in my case, C-130s that were at Jacobabad, Pakistan. And uh, we, we, we seized the base, we landed our, uh, our C-130s. 
at the time the sun came up, we had you know over 500 Marines on the ground there. So you're on the ground in Indian country. You've just projected force. You're south of Kandahar at Camp Rhino. What happens next? So we, we, all we did is we built up forces there, and we, we turned it into a full operating base, a forward operating base Rhino. And we did, from there, we did a lot of follow-on operations, both uh, ground as well as air operations. Uh, we did the first interdiction patrols. I, I participated in that patrol in uh, November of 2001. We cut uh, Afghan Route 1, which is what became the ring road that goes all the way around Afghanistan. We basically cut that between Lashkargah and Kandahar. And then subsequently, part of our force seized Kandahar Airport, which we then opened up as a full-on air base that we ultimately turned over to the United States Army. So all these forces are deploying to Afghanistan. This won't be your last tour in Afghanistan. So how does this first tour end? And where do you go from there? It really did. It ended, uh, it ended with a mission that never happened. You know, we, we were there in Afghanistan when uh, Tora Bora was not properly addressed by U.S. forces. You know, it turned out that our, our efforts there failed to capture Osama bin Laden. We had actually planned some operations uh, into the Tora Bora area, but they, they were never uh, authorized. We never conducted those missions. It's one of the big regrets that I have in our Marine Corps, my Marine Corps experience, is that we weren't given that mission to Tora Bora to, you know, to, to stop uh, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, from going into Pakistan and disappearing. So the war has started in Afghanistan. We're trying to control the country. In the meantime, a new war is starting in Iraq. It seems like you stayed in Afghanistan. How did that affect operations? Well, so ultimately, uh, we came out of Afghanistan in the beginning of 2002, January 2002. We uh, pulled all of uh, the, the stuff up at Fob Rhino. Uh, the, the base at Kandahar at the airport stayed. And we actually moved out of theater. We went back onto our ships and then went back to Perth, Australia, and then sailed back to San Diego. We got back in uh, the uh, beginning of 2002, sort of thing. That was right when the war in Iraq was starting to, to be talked about a lot and ramping up. And it was actually the same uh, Marines from, in this case, uh, Camp Pendleton, but also from Camp Lejeune that formed the force that ultimately you know, was the one that went into the invasion of Iraq. So I, I had actually been selected to go to a school called the Marine Corps School of Advanced Warfighting in the summer of 2002. So while I was in Afghanistan, I, I got a notification that, hey, you were accepted for this school. Uh, so I went back to Quantico for uh, you know, basically for a year while the buildup into Iraq went and then the actual invasion of Iraq happened in 2003. Now with Advanced Warfighting School, they're investing in you to become a field grade officer? That's right. So I was, I was a very junior major at the time. I think I was the, uh, the youngest major ever to attend the School of Advanced Warfighting at the time. And it was kind of interesting because uh, while we were in school is when the invasion of Iraq uh, happened. Some of my classmates were actually pulled out of school and they were the ones that were going to be assigned to the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, which did the invasion. Uh, they went and they helped out in the invasion of Iraq. It was kind of a uh, kind of a unique year for us. So after school, we gained a lot of valuable knowledge. Where do you go next? So I had just gotten a new you know new military occupational specialty, 0505 uh, operational planner, and then I was sent to the Pentagon for my first tour doing a strategy uh, effort. At the at that time, there was a thing called the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is every four years, Congress required the Department of Defense to do a strategy review. I was part of that for, for two years. Uh, in between, though, I had done a tour at the White House as a White House fellow. Uh, I'd been selected by George W. Bush and appointed, uh, and I'd done that for a year. So I had quite a unique experience in 2003, 2004, uh, until I'd finished out at the Pentagon in 2006. And after the Pentagon, what next? Uh, so then, then it's time for me to actually go back to the operating forces again. And I went down, I was going to be sent to Camp Lejeune this time in, uh, in 2006. Uh, at, I, at the time I'd been married, my wife and I, we had three children at the time. We were living in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, so before I moved my family down there, I went down and checked in to my new units. Hey, what's, you know, what's going on? They said, hey, 
don't unpack your stuff because you're going to Afghanistan for a year uh, for one of the transition teams that were, that were going to go to help stand up the Afghan National Army. So in 2006, I was, uh, I was assigned to that duty, and I pu pulled the team together. Uh, we trained for about three or four months, did training at Mountain Warfare Training Center in Bridgeport, California, all sorts of weapons training, uh, very seasoned group of staff non-commissioned officers, specialty MOSs, about 17 of us, and we were, our job was to go and be the combat advisors for an Afghan National Army Battalion uh, in 2007. Wow, so here, I assume you're there in Afghanistan, it's cold, you're in the middle of nowhere? Uh, so we actually started, the, 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 the army itself was standing up in a variety of areas. The battalion that we were assigned to was actually in Kabul, uh, but we had been, I did operations, I want to say, in about seven different provinces in Afghanistan during that tour. We built a fort operating base up in Kapisa province in the middle of the winter. We did a variety of uh, demining missions around Kabul. We we're, were basically blowing up bad ordnance, old ordnance. We trained the Afghans. And then in the spring of 2007, we deployed that battalion uh, to Kunar province, which is up on the Afghan-Pakistan border, where we had fort operating bases in five different locations, including Gawardash and Kamu, and ultimately Camp Keating, which is where, uh, if, you saw, if you've ever seen the movie The Outpost, uh, I was at The Outpost, uh, where one of my teams with an Afghan uh, company was stationed in 2007. So when you're saying your battalion deployed, you're talking the Afghan National Army? That's right. It was, it was the Afghan National uh, Army, uh, 3rd Kandak, 1st Brigade, 201st Corps at the time. It was a uh, Afghan National Army battalion out of the Camp Darulaman, Camp Black Horse out of Kabul. Well, culturally, there's a big difference in culture. So what was that experience like? It was a great experience. You know, I, I got to, uh, to work with the Afghans between uh, our job, which was to provide all the support for them, to train them, to uh, support them in the field, to provide medevac, to provide uh, logistic support. We did all of those things. Uh, quite the adventure, uh, adventure of a lifetime, getting to know uh, the, the Kandak commander, the executive officer, all the staff, all the companies. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, quite a unique experience. So you're at Camp Keating, and part of the story is it had to be located there next to the village, and you're looking up into the Amalias of mountains? We, we knew it was a bad location. It was originally designed to be the provincial reconstruction team for Kamdesh, which was that area of Nuristan. Very remote, very hard to access by ground. And in fact, our, in our first mission to go to combat outpost Camus, uh, we were actually, our, our team was ambushed, and one of my Marines was wounded there, and, and uh, many of the Afghans were killed. So it was a very rough neighborhood uh, up in the Hindu Kush. Very tall mountains. Uh, it was so t the mountains were so tall that when we would fly our helicopters through the valleys, uh, sometimes the the insurgents would try to shoot down at them with RPGs. So that was a year in Afghanistan advising the Afghan National Army. That's right. And then what happened? Well, so all, all tours of duty end ultimately. Uh, we were we were relieved with another uh, training team, embedded training team that came out of uh, Okinawa, uh, and they took the the Kandak that I was with. They took over that, and we redeployed back to Camp Lejeune. And I, I went right back to work. You know, uh, the job there at uh, Camp Lejeune was to help get the next Marine Air Ground Task Force ready for the mission into Al Ambar Province. The Marines had one of the big sectors. And we were there to get that those uh, team to, to create the new MAGTAF, deploy it, and then support it while it was deployed. And what year is this, sir? This would have been in 2008. Okay. 2007 so to 2008. So we read about how arrested Al Anbar is. It's like the center of the insurgency, right? It very much was. It was a very, uh, very tough neighborhood. And what was your experience there? Well, so I did not deploy to Iraq. We were there to support, we, we created, and then we deployed the Marines to Iraq. Uh, and at that point, then I took command of the Weapons Training Battalion in 2008 uh, that does all the marksmanship training for all of the Camp Lejeune uh, units. So that was a job that, that put me in command of a battalion for about two years. So 
battalion commander, that's quite a step up, is it not? It is, and it's part of the Marine Corps system. You know, you remember, I only signed up for three and a half years to begin with, sort of thing. But the Marine Corps, they keep sending you back to school, they keep offering you promotions, they keep offering you, uh, you know, good jobs, sort of thing. So ultimately, I, I did that job, and then I was selected to go to the National Defense University, uh, to the Eisenhower School, which is uh, where I got another master's degree in, uh, in, in this case, national resource management. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't know, what was the first master's degree? Uh, well, the first Marine Corps one was at the School of Advanced Warfighting. Uh -huh. uh, I also did one at the what's now the National Intelligence University, the National Defense Intelligence College uh, at the time, in a, a Master of Science of Strategic Intelligence. So I, I did a lot of stuff. I, I did get my degree at Georgetown. Uh, Got the, uh, the you know another degree from the the Marine Corps, so to speak, at the National Defense University. So I like to say I'm highly overeducated. Huh. But a lot of a lot of motivation required for all that, sir. A lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. So now you've commanded a battalion for two years, weapons training battalion, training Marines how to manage their what shoot their weapons, right? That's right. What's your next assignment? So when I went to National Defense University, I was part of a, a program called the Afghan. Pakistan Hands Fellowship. Part of the year I spent there, I, it was a real deep dive into the war in Afghanistan, basically. Uh, and because of that, I went to serve at the uh, International Security For Assistance Force headquarters in Kabul for my third tour in Afghanistan from 2011 to 2012. I was, I was stationed in Kabul. So you're right at the very top of IS ISAF, that's the multinational? Yes. And could you tell us a little bit about that kind of duty? Yeah, so that was uh, doing strategic communications for the commander. Uh, it was all big picture uh, elements. We uh, did work all over the world, including uh, going to Europe. To We had a lot of our European allies who had come into Afghanistan under Article 5 NATO operations, uh, as well as working within uh, the theater itself, uh, you know, working with uh, the Afghans, the Afghan government, uh, trying to, you know, to make a difference there. It was during the surge, so it was very, uh, it was a very hectic time. And could you quickly cover the surge for us? Well, if you recall, uh, we had done the surge in Iraq to, you know, to save the Iraqi government from collapsing. Uh, but at the same time we'd done the surge, we said, well, we're only going to do it for a limited amount of time, and we're essentially going to withdraw. Uh, and I think that uh, at, the, at the time, the Obama administration thought Afghanistan was the good war. And they were convinced that we could win the war with a surge into Afghanistan. Uh, at the time, I, I never believed that. Uh, in retrospect, I never believed it. Uh, and as you see with the, the, you know, the pullout of Afghanistan, it didn't work. So you have the knowledge. You've been on the ground. Why didn't you believe it? Well, uh, the, the Afghans weren't ready for a U.S.-style government. Uh, they, they mostly uh, were too corrupt. Uh, they would take whatever advantage they could of uh, U.S. service personnel coming in on one-year tours of duty, doing a job, uh, trying to make a difference. But ultimately, uh, Afghan itself is a very fractured society. There is no unity amongst the, uh, uh, the Afghans. I, I don't think that Afghanistan is a country. I think it's a place between places. It's stuck between Pakistan, the former Soviet Union to the north, and Iran to its west. So it's never had a cohesive government, and they've been in civil war for about 40 years now, and I don't think that uh, the prospects are not good for, for Afghanistan going forward. So now you're at the highest levels of the operations in Afghanistan on your third tour. You still have another tour left, is that correct? No, that was my third tour. Of duty. That was your third tour? That's right. Okay. So let's keep talking about how you felt about Afghanistan. You go back. Your next assignment in the Marine Corps is? Uh, so f after I left Afghanistan, uh, I went to run an organization called the U.S. Marine Corps Small War Center. Basically, it's all of the operations that uh, are, con are conducted short of war, uh, one of them being counterinsurgency. So my role after having seen the Afghan campaign and uh, worked closely with those in Afghanistan or in, in the Iraq uh, theater was to rewrite the counterinsurgency manual for the Marine Corps and the Army. And we successfully got that through. Uh, we did a lot of different work. Uh, at that point, it was uh, you know I'd been in the Marine Corps for you know 22 
years at this point. Keeping in mind, I'd only intended to stay for three and a half. Uh, my wife and I, we, our son was born at Camp Lejeune, and we ultimately decided that 24 years was enough service, uh, and it was time to, you know, to retire from the Marine Corps. So that was your sunset cruise, rewriting the counterinsurgency manual? One of the, yeah, one of the many tasks that I did at Quantico. I also, because I'd worked on the strategy review at the Pentagon before, I did a lot of work in the Pentagon itself in Washington, D.C., uh, having to do with the strategy review. So uh, at that point, that was my fifth MOS as a ground colonel. Uh, I, you do a lot of different things, and I, I certainly did a lot of uh, different things in those, uh, in those years before I left service. So here you are, your career. Uh, Afghanistan, you've seen it, you've tasted it, you've been there years of your life. And now, just this past year, we pull out of Afghanistan. How did you feel about that? Uh, that was a, it was a real shame, the way things turned out in Afghanistan, the way uh, that, that, our, that they pulled the plug without having adequate mechanisms in place to manage the outcome. Sort of thing. You saw it, that they, they weren't prepared because they had to send the Marines in. And these were, uh, you know, you could have predicted that the Afghans were going to be desperate to leave. The ones that we had worked with for, you know, the better part of 20 years, uh, they'd been our allies, they'd been our interpreters. They wanted out of Afghanistan in the worst way, sort of thing. Uh, you know, policy is policy. You look at it from one perspective. I think we should have kept a small footprint in Afghanistan for a long time. We don't have to, you know, reducing our commitment. We never should have surged. We should have kept a small commitment there. How we left our allies there is, you know, is reprehensible in my book. So, being as you're assigned with the Afghan National Army, I'm sure you've sat sure with the locals. How do you feel about the people and the culture? Uh, so, uh, the individual Afghans they vary based on where they were from. They're still, at the time I served there, they're a very tribal society. Uh, they, you know, were not united, and not cohesive in whether it was a province or whether it was the country as a whole. Like I said, I think Afghanistan is a is a place between places. Uh, but I had good relations with many of the Afghans that I worked with uh, because that was my job. Was to, you know that was part of the the diplomatic side was to be able to go to Ashura and talk to people about a variety of things. Sometimes you didn't trust them. I'm I'm pretty sure. Uh, up in Kunar province that, that some of the Afghans that we were working with were working with the other side as well. But that's the nature of, of, the, uh, of the war, especially in the far provinces up in the Hindu Kush. So I see from your DD-214 here that you did get the combat action ribbon, so you've actually been in fights. It was, that was actually our, uh, the middle tour in uh, 2007. We were up at those uh, bases, combat outposts, and mm -hmm. up at uh, what became Fab Bostic uh, up in Kunar. Uh, and it was a very active, very busy time. And, you know, the, uh, there were lots of what we call ticks, troops in contact, all the time. I mentioned we, we had an ambush there before, and our, our base was rocketed. Uh, and of course, we're going to shoot back. So ultimately, having invested so much time in Afghanistan, we withdrew. Why did the Taliban come back so strong? Well, you know, ultimately the Taliban would say to the Americans, you have all the watches, but we have all the time. And it's very true. They basically waited us out until uh, the administration, in, in a moment of weakness, uh, showed that we weren't going to stay. And this is the same uh, administration that left Iraq in the lurch. It's the same group of people that left Afghanistan in the lurch. They're almost you know, to a person, I can name them, uh, those responsible for the policy. Uh, and it's, it's short-sighted because now, uh, instead, if you look at, at where Iraq is and where Afghanistan is, who's right between them? Iran. And who's on the march today in the world? Iran. Uh, so I think it was very short-sighted. So looking back on your 24 years in the Marine Corps, could you share some observations? Oh, so I, I was very proud to serve in the Marine Corps. I, I'm very fortunate to be part of such a great organization. Um, like I said, I think the military is the number one institution of national unity that we have. And I think the Marine Corps does it very well uh, for bringing people from all over the United States together, to serve together for a time, to complete a common mission.
ambition to be able to you know do what the country needs it to be done to be done for them I am very proud that in this day and age this set of wars Iraq and Afghanistan that people don't blame the troops for the failures of policymakers and like like it was in Vietnam uh, you know I think it's a real shame that you would blame people that were drafted into the military uh, for the failings of policymakers, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. Uh, they're just doing their job on behalf of their country. And that's when they make that ultimate sacrifice to do so. Their families, you know, some of them are killed or injured. Uh, we, we have an obligation to all of our veterans, particularly on uh, what's today called PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, to make sure that we take care of all of our veterans. And that's part of why I continue to serve today in, in the case now in the state legislature is so I have the ability to advocate on behalf of our veterans uh, to continue uh, to support them as long as it's necessary because we, the American people, put them into harm's way, into Iraq, into Afghanistan, uh, and we owe them uh, that. And that's, par that's part of the reason why I continue to serve. Well, let me ask you about that. You're leaving the Marine Corps after 24 years, you're coming back home, and I know you continued in public service, but as you get back into civilian society, I think every Marine has a little bit of a transition there. Could you describe yours? So uh, every Marine does have a transition. Every service member, uh, from wherever they are around the country, whenever they get out, they have a transition. And for me, I was very fortunate. Uh, I kind of thought about it ahead of time, and where do you want to live? My wife and I, we had four children. We bought a farm about a mile from where I grew up the little hamlet of Miko, which is a fantastic little place. And my, my job for the first year uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps was actually to build a house on our, on our farm, taking all those skills I learned as a kid in my family's uh, masonry construction business, and actually build a house on a farm. Uh, and I also took a lot of my experience when I, that I had learned when I uh, was a White House fellow at the U.S. Department of Energy, and I built a, you know, a very creative house on my uh, on my farm there. That was my first year. But like like any good thing, it comes to an end. Uh, and after a while, my wife encouraged me to, to, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, get some new, uh, get a new job sort of thing. And that's when I had gotten appointed by the governor of New York to run a public benefit corporation, the Hudson River Black River Regulating District, uh, which is partially based in my hometown. It actually covers 10 counties in upstate New York. But, uh, but I was selected to be the executive director of that organization. Uh, a perfect transition from the Marine Corps, from you know, being a colonel in the Marine Corps to you know, running, in this case, a, a New York State Public Benefit Corporation. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a good transition. But you're going from a, you have the administrative experience and the man leadership experience to do this, but you're leading civilians. What was that transition like? Uh, like anything else, uh, you know, you have to, Learn the organization. Uh, in this case, I learned a lot about Albany because I was part of the uh, one of the groups that reported to the governor through the executive chamber. Uh, and I, I quickly found out, and, and this is kind of a funny story, is the governor's office didn't know that I was a Republican because they had asked me to come in for my background interview after I'd been in the job for nine months, sort of thing. The state police, you know, somewhat sheepishly asked, "Hey, can you?" Can you come in so we can talk to you about your background for the, you know, the job that you're holding? Uh, which made it even more interesting because when my hometown assembly person, uh, he decided to retire, you know, some people encouraged me to, to look at the job and to run. And when I announced that I was going to run for the job, I was immediately fired by the governor because I was, uh, you know, a, as a Republican, uh, which was uh, somewhat ironic, I think, uh, given the. I was, I was successfully elected, and then the governor who fired me was actually forced to resign himself for uh, sexual harassment problems. So how many years have you been in Assemblyman? Uh, so I've been in office for four years. I was at Hudson River Black River Regulating District for two years, and now I've been in office for four years, and I was just most recently re-elected to another two-year term. And how are you applying your leadership skills to that position? Because I'm sure it's a little more collaborative as opposed to being directed. Well, it's a, so it is a legislative job as opposed to, uh, you know, being sort of a national security executive. But many of the skills I learned, in, in, for instance, in a place like Afghanistan, are really important to learn how to, to, to be diplomatic, to uh, find out what's
what's going on and find out what's possible and then you know do the job based on that i really enjoy representing the people of the hundred eighty assembly district in the assembly because they're the, they're the people i grew up with they're the people you know i came home to and i'm very grateful for their support and sending me to albany so that same type of community relations uh, that you developed in afghanistan obviously works here it, it really does and i, I re like I say i really love the people uh, i i think about it is what can i do to make my district better what can i do to make my state better what can i do uh, you know to advance the cause uh, that i so believe in that the people i represent you know want in albany so i take our voice our values i take them right to albany well that's excellent sir i would want to ask in closing out of all the officers you served with, was there any examples of leadership of who influenced the person you are that you'd like to share with us? Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do first, I want to talk about uh, the staff non-commissioned officers. Because I had mentioned I served with the gunnery sergeant, Michael Chan. Uh, what I didn't say is that I served with him in 1992 and 1993. Now, what I didn't say is, is that I served again with him 2001 when he was a sergeant major he was part of the aviation combat element that we went into Afghanistan with so I served with him again in in Afghanistan uh, but tragedy always seems to strike he had actually retired from the Marine Corps as a sergeant major and he'd begun working as a contractor and he was actually captured by insurgents in the Basra area uh, he was kept captive for about uh, almost a better part of a year uh, and then he was killed and it took us a long time to get his remains back. And it was my job, as a, as a final act, was to bring his remains uh, from, in this case, Philadelphia, from the East Coast, back to his wife in San Diego, and we buried him in San Diego. So, you know, of all the people that affected me, uh, who do I remember most? It's actually Sergeant Major Jan, because uh, we have a relationship that took me from being a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps to bringing his remains back to his wife as a colonel and laying him to rest at the, at the National Cemetery in La Jolla. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, sir. That's a story. Marines take care of their own. Marines do. Yes. Well, we appreciate you coming in this morning, sir, and sharing your experience with us, and this will become a valuable addition to our archive. Thank you again for coming in this morning. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And to all our veterans out there,